Um, so without no, without no further ado, I would like to uh, have the uh, the introduction of our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Timothy Limfield. Uh, he manages the NVIDIA's uh, European Solution Architecture and Engineering Team. He has over 25 years of experience in HPC, starting as computational scientist in the British Aerospace Corporate Research Center, and then moving to technical pre-sales role in Hitachi, ClearSpeed, and most recently, NVIDIA. Uh, he has a degree in electrical engineering and a PhD for research in the field of graph theory, uh, both from Imperial uh, College London. Uh, he is a chartered engineer and member of the Institution of Engineering Technology. Uh, and uh, Timothy will give us today a talk about uh, a universal accelerated computing platform for the data center. Uh, the floor is yours, Timothy. Perfect. So, sorry, I um, <coughs> arranged all the windows on my screen so I could see everything I need to see. Um, so, Sabe, thank you once again for the uh, introduction and the invitation to talk uh, at this uh, workshop. Uh, we're in winter in uh, NVIDIA, uh, in, in the UK at the moment. And um, this workshop often occurs during the European winter time, so it's always a pleasure for me to come to Saudi Arabia and see the sun uh, in the middle of our winter. But unfortunately, I can't do so this year. Uh, but I'm pleased to come and be able to talk to you today uh, remotely. So Saber, in his introduction, talked about a, li a little about the way that the uh, the GPU technology, accelerated computing technology, has evolved from its uh, very early days when you were uh, focusing on programming the GPU very explicitly using CUDA, uh, and especially for scientific computing um, uh, applications. But since then, the technologies for programming the GPU have evolved, and furthermore, the um, the breadth of problem that a GPU that accelerated computing can address has also evolved. And what I'd like to do in this presentation is talk about some of the ways that the use of the GPU has expanded from its early days uh, up until to now it's in a much broader position within the data center addressing all several sorts of problems. So we've been doing accelerated computing at NVIDIA for uh, 25 years. Um, maybe not accelerating scientific computing for 25 years, but certainly uh, for 25 years, we've worked on accelerating the, uh, the use of the GPU for uh, graphics. And of course, NVIDIA has a long heritage of uh, graphic graphics, and that's the origins of this uh, particular uh, computer architecture that has been generalized to all sorts of other things. So starting 25 years ago with addressing the problem of how do we uh, accelerate the problem of uh, putting beautiful pictures onto a screen and expanding there to other sorts of, uh, ex of acceleration. And uh, you will see that in this left hand box of the screen that the um, uh, that the there are now three uh, sorts of processes appear in the computer. Um, the GPU that we uh, we've not talked about for several years of this workshop, the CPU that has been the basis for computing uh, for many decades, but also a new concept of the DPU, the data processing unit, which has uh, come about from the recent acquisition by Nvidia of uh, of Mellanox. So I want to spend a little bit of time during this presentation later on talking about the addition of the DPU to the family of accelerated computing engines. Another aspect of, uh, the, of accelerated computing is that it's not just about hardware. Um, certainly you have to provide uh, good hardware, 
But of course, you also need to be able to provide the full stack of uh, tools and libraries and applications and frameworks that the, uh, the user is going to need to be able to make his application successfully. And this is one of the places where NVIDIA has heavily invested over the uh, 25 years is in creating this full stack solution, not just the hardware, but everything that's needed to exploit the hardware effectively. Um, we have many different scales of computing to think about uh, when we do high performance, highly parallel computing. You have uh, parallelism within a processor, uh, whether that's multiple threads within a CPU or uh, AVX within a CPU, or within the accelerated computing engine like a GPU, you have, again, lots of threads, lots of functional units that need to be harnessed. And so you have parallelism within the device itself. You may have several uh, devices within a, within a node, and I was pleased to see that in the description of the hackathon projects, several of you are now looking at how can you uh, expand the scope of parallelism within your application to cover multiple GPUs, perhaps within a node. And even beyond that, uh, we have uh, many nodes within our uh, supercomputing cluster. And so you also need to be able to scale up to the point of use it, distributing your application across multiple nodes. And the, the, the problem with an accelerated computing is that you have to be able to address all of these different uh, scales of parallelism within the system. Uh, and the, so it's, it's, GPU computing is much more than worrying about the GPU. <clears throat> and then finally, we have on the right-hand side here of this, uh, of this box, uh, a key element of the NVIDIA success story with good relationships that we have with our developers. Um, they tell us what they need. We listen to what they say. That goes back into the uh, development of the CUDA platform. And because we have a consistent year-on-year, -year, consistent year-on-year -year CUDA platform, uh, we can bring the developer community with us uh, on this journey of accelerated computing. And uh, I think the, uh, this CAST workshop is perhaps uh, some evidence of that, that um, over, several, over seven years now, uh, we've been coming back and the community at KAUST has been moving forward with us uh, on the journey of effectively exploiting the GPUs for the different sorts of work they want to do. The world of computing uh, is growing dramatically. Um, as uh, Sabir mentioned in the introduction, I've been doing uh, HPC for um, a couple of decades now. And at that point, uh, the, when I started, uh, supercomputers were large machines, and they're still, of course, very large machines locked in a special room that you addressed with a batch uh, uh, job submission system. And that was all you, that was what you really had to think about was uh, writing your application, submitting it through a batch script onto the supercomputer, uh, and waiting for the results to come back. Um, the world of supercomputing now has changed dramatically. So we've expanded from this simulation now. Um, there are many other aspects to high performance computing that, in, that need to be addressed by the ecosystem of, uh, of, um, of uh, parallel computing. So not just simulation, but also visualization. Uh, the scientists need to view and understand uh, visually their data sets. And of course, KAUST has a, a very, uh, an excellent and sophisticated uh, visualization lab. Uh, AI uh, is another area with, that is now becoming a core part of high performance computing. Um, and I will show some examples uh, in the recent years of where in the Gordon Bell Prize winning uh, submissions, uh, they've won by being able to couple uh, artificial intelligence with the scientific computing aspects. The places where we are doing our, our computation are also becoming much more diversified. It's not just the supercomputer, but also we have uh, cloud service providers that are providing high performance uh, systems. Uh, and we have uh, very powerful systems now at our edge 
that are collecting data from the field and feeding this data back into the simulation systems. And then finally, you have a perhaps a complement to artificial intelligence, which is a more generalized uh, machine learning uh, and data analytics uh, platforms. And um, NVIDIA is in recent years showing some good progress in making in making these data analytics platforms available on the GPU as well. And so the goal of NVIDIA has been to uh, bring the solution of the CUDA architecture and the CUDA platform to all of these uh, diverse um, applications of accelerated computing. And they're just listed here, and I won't I'm not go through and talk about every one of them in detail. But what the, the, the point I want to make is that the, uh, <coughs> the GPU is a universal platform that is used in all sorts of, uh, of accelerated computing applications. So let's begin by spending some time talking about the CUDA platform and some of the uh, recent innovations in, in this area. So these are four places in which NVIDIA is uh, really driving forward innovation to try to maintain the pace of uh, development of the CUDA platform and maintain its, applica its applicability in many areas. I'm going to talk about each of these uh, a little bit just for just a couple of minutes uh, with different slides. So I mentioned already in, in the introduction that we have to deal with a hierarchy of, of uh, parallelism. Um, we have to think about asynchronous computing. As soon as you start doing things synchronously, that will introduce barriers in, into your uh, progress uh, and will inhibit the level of parallelism that's available to you. And so we have to think all the time about how to reduce uh, async, how, sorry, not how to reduce, but how to in increase and add asynchronous computing within our computing model. And the, perhaps the complement to that is latency. How can we overcome the problems of latency? Uh, because you know, latency is largely dictated by physical laws, such as the speed of light. Um, and so we need to find ways of hiding latency in some ways. And then finally, we want to be able to open the world of accelerated computing to as large an audience as possible. And again, uh, Saber talked about the progress he's already seen uh, over the few years of the CAS workshop from, uh, let's say, hardcore CUDA programming to uh, much easier uh, open ACC programming. Uh, and he gave the specific example of a a newcomer to accelerate computing who within just a few days work was able to make progress on his application and get it running using some uh, some more um, some easier to use uh, tools such as OpenACC and indeed we're going even further with that in bringing uh, accelerated computing parallel computing into standard languages. So let's think a little bit about the sorts of hierarchy of parallelism that we have to deal with. Um, so we have here you know, the sorts of scope at which NVIDIA and Acceler all, all accelerated computing has to deal with. So on the left hand side here we have the system wide scope. Uh, you will have uh, in house in your machine rooms uh, racks of servers uh, like these. And the, you need to be able to manage these systems well, you need to operate them well, expose them to your users in a reliable fashion, and keep uh, monitoring the uh, monitor effectively those uh, systems, keep the uh, and make sure that there are no uh, un uh, unintended. Uh, people using the systems. So keeping control of the whole system is important. You have now very complex nodes within uh, the uh, servers. The days of a single uh, processor within a, within a node are long past. Now we have multiple CPUs and multiple GPUs even within a single node, and of course potentially storage within that node as well. And you need to be able to move data smoothly around these very these various elements of the system um, 
at the maximum speed so that data can be at the right point uh, at the right time so that you can do the, the, process, the, the computations that you want. And then finally, you have the uh, highly parallel accelerator computing engine itself, uh, where the, the thing that you really need to be programming directly. And here is where we start to talk about the programming models that are needed for, for working on, it, on, um, on GPUs. This is the most recent uh, addition to the uh, different sorts of scope, uh, different sorts of um, hierarchy, different of the various hierarchy of programming models that we have to deal with in GPUs now, which we call the the multi-instance GPU or MIG for short. What we found is that the degree of parallelism within uh, modern GPUs has become so high that uh, not all applications are able to take advantage of the high degree of parallelism that's available within the physical processor itself. And therefore, one of the uh, a solution that we're proposing to, to deal with this is to be able to subdivide the GPU into multiple pieces. Uh, in the case of the A100 GPU, we can now physically subdivide the GPU into seven instances. And these appear as seven uh, totally independent uh, and isolated GPUs. So uh, the, two, um, the two goals that were had, that were put forward for designing this uh, multi-instance GPU was, first of all, to have no changes in the programming model. So each of these small GPUs uh, is programmed in exactly the same way as the full GPU would be. Um, there are no changes to the programming model. Uh, and the second thing was to maintain high isolation and high security uh, and independence between these several um, small GPUs. And so, for example, if a job would uh, crash on one of the MIG instances, it would have no influence on the job. And of course, we maintain uh, separate memory spaces so that it's impossible for one MIG instance to read or write data in another MIG instance. And you can see a uh, several couple of applications for this. Uh, so perhaps in a, an educational environment like at KAUST, uh, if you are running a class, you would be able to take your single physical GPU and divide it into seven pieces and hand out a small GPU to each of your students so they could run their, their classes on the smaller GPUs. Or if you had um, you know, a team, a development team, they could work on the small GPUs, so the, the MIG instances uh, to develop the application. And once the application is developed, then scale it up to the full GPU. Alternatively, as I said, if you have applications that cannot take um, full benefit of the parallelism within the GPU, then they can uh, run multiple copies of an application uh, in a single instance uh, so that's to increase the throughput. So that's some, an example of uh, different hierarchies. What about uh, asynchronous computing and latency? So there are uh, a number of overheads involved in all computing. Um, one is the uh, execution overheads, um, which are involved in, uh, which you can perhaps uh, solve by using uh, hardware and system efficiency improvements. For example, special methods of um, moving data between a disk and a GPU memory, or from GPU memory to a network. Uh, and then you also have uh, operational, la la operational latencies, which you, which you can perhaps improve by, um, imp by working on the different hardware and software improvements. And so one of the things that we've done in the latest release of CUDA is to uh, be able to overlap moving of data from memory into the GPU for the pro during the prologue of, uh, of a kernel launch. So you can set up the kernel while simultaneously uh, moving data from GPU memory into the GPU core. And this will again hide some of the initial startup latencies 
of getting data into the GPU so it can start processing. And then we'll to spend a little bit of time looking about how are we going to, what's the direction of programming GPUs. So you will have seen um, uh, this diagram several times from NVIDIA, I think. Um, so on the uh, extreme left-hand side of the diagram, you have um, the way of building, you have the idea of building parallel computing syntax into standard languages. And this is really the, the, the right place to do it. And the end goal of NVIDIA uh, and the community should be to uh, support parallel computing within the standardized languages, C++, Fortran, and so on. Uh, and that, that, that uh, has already started. Um, you, you will now see uh, within those uh, language standard, standard, standards, uh, parallel computing syntax. We also have in the middle uh, the way of uh, getting a little bit more control over how things are done. So controlling specifically where and when data is moved around and uh, using the uh, OpenACC directives and other similar sorts of, um, of directives. And then finally, on the right-hand side, uh, if you really want to extract the very last amount of performance out of your device, then you can go down to the low level and program the GPU uh, explicitly using the CUDA programming language. And so this is the current state of, of affairs in which we have these three uh, options available to you. But perhaps the, the ideal goal we want to years is to be able to uh, only perhaps only offer two options, have make sure that the standard languages are sufficiently rich and capable of, program, of uh, writing accelerated computing applications, that you can uh, do everything you need to do within the standard languages, uh, still leaving the option open of uh, programming in uh, CUDA if you really want to extract the very last amount of performance out of the device itself. And so these are some of the initiatives that NVIDIA is taking within the C++ programming community. Uh, we have uh, representatives within the standardization boards of these languages. Um, uh, so for example, the um, the parallel uh, library, the parallel um, uh, parallel library was uh, modeled on um, an NVIDIA application, an NVIDIA model first of all, and that model was taken and standardized and put, put into the C++ 17 language. And then we've got uh, other things in which uh, you can see here uh, in which the uh, scope of the C++ standard is going to be expanded to cope with the sorts of things that we need to see in accelerated computing in the future. We do have uh, libraries uh, and the number of libraries that are available is of course is growing over the years and uh, this, uh, this chart shows some of where we are right now. Linear algebra libraries, sparse linear algebra libraries, um, tensor, li tensor algebra libraries, and in particular tensor al algebra libraries supporting reduced precision, and so on and so forth, so that you have all of the, all the tools that the applications will need to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, port your applications to uh, an accelerated computing platform. There is within C++, of course, a standard library. The, the, spec, the specification of C++ is of a language itself, plus a standardized lib library that goes with that, uh, with that standard language. And similarly, we want to do make a similar sort of move with CUDA C++. So the language has been there for many years. It's evolving slowly. Uh, the fundamentals don't change, but uh, things are being added to it. And one of our uh, new uh, initiatives has been to add um, a, a standard library to the CUDA programming language. 
And that standard library course, uh, first of all, must be compatible with the ISO uh, initiatives, the ISO C++ initiatives. So we strictly conform to the uh, ISO standard itself. And we add uh, extensions to that idea uh, that you can opt into uh, incrementally as you start getting into the world of, uh, of heterogeneous computing. So it doesn't interfere in any way with what you want to do. Uh, it does support moving data between devices and host and device are treated equally and calls to functions can be done uh, either from the host or the device. Uh, and uh, of course it takes us a while to build up such a large amount of infrastructure. Um, so we will we have a subset of the standard library today that was introduced in CUDA 10.2. And with each release of CUDA, we will gradually build up support for, the, uh, for this uh, library infrastructure. We have a, uh, a unified uh, HPC SDK. Um, one of the things that you will see in here in the compilers, you will talk, we'll see, you'll see NVC, NVC++, and NV Fortran. And these are the compilers that perhaps previously would have known under the PGI brand. Uh, these uh, the same compilers. We have the same engineers working on them. Uh, if you are an enterprise and want uh, enterprise support for your for your PGI compiler use, that is still available. But the compiler itself is now provided uh, free of charge within the uh, NVIDIA HPC SDK. And of course, the SDK has all the things that you need: uh, programming models, compilers, libraries. Uh, libraries for communications and the tools that you're going to need to run your applications, uh, profilers and debuggers and so on. Another initiative that we've been working on for the last uh, couple of years and are now uh, bringing to market is what we call uh, Magnum IO. A Magnum IO really is an umbrella term that covers all of the uh, all of the initiatives we are making in terms of moving data around, and uh, this is a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, there are always two aspects to to computing fast, getting results fast. One is how fast can you do the calculations, and the second aspect of it is how fast can you move your data around. And so we have within the umbrella of uh, Magnum IO um, networking. Uh, storage I.O., uh, computing within the network, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the data processing unit, which does computing within the network rather than computing within the node, and the various sorts of tools, again, that you need to be able to manage your I.O. components. And so, unsurprisingly, the uh, Magnum I.O. Uh, toolbox has a similar sort of uh, similar sort of architectures and principles as the CUDA computing toolbox. So again, we always have to think about concurrency. How can we do things in parallel? How can we do things asynchronously? How can we scale uh, across the full level of hierarchy that's needed from the processor to the full data center? How can we uh, monitor? How can we develop tools to monitor that uh, I.O. system and uh, keep track of what's happening? <clears throat> and perhaps one more thing is how can we abstract the uh, I.O. Um, concepts so that we can effectively work with all of our storage partners so they can make uh, specific implementations of the Magnum I.O. model on top of their storage uh, architecture. So I want now to move on and spend a bit of time talking about the uh, data processing unit. And as I said in the introduction, uh, NVIDIA earlier this year acquired the uh, Mellanox company, um, well known for its InfiniBand networking products. But the um, networking is it's, it's becoming a much more intelligent and active part of the system these days. Um, the data center, um, which is the level at which NVIDIA is now conceiving of our work, 
um, consists of a number of components. Um, it's the, the CPU will all, is there, always will be there within the, uh, within the server. The GPU is there to accelerate the computing. And the DPU, the data processing unit, is there to accelerate uh, da data intensive tasks and facilitate the rapid movement of data around the, around the system. And so uh, in the past, um, we had the concept of, uh, in the middle, uh, the management of the node uh, in terms of networking, in terms of security, uh, in terms of managing and monitoring the system, in terms of the storage, was done by the CPU on the host system. And you had um, a fairly unintelligent uh, interface card sitting on the CPU that would, uh, for, to which you could offload data movement from one node to another. So the concept of the DPU, uh, the goal that we are taking, the direction we're taking the DPU is to offload from the, uh, the server itself to the uh, D DPU sitting within the host, the HCA, all of this, uh, a lot of this, all of this infrastructure and management work. So if we can, for example, uh, do all of our security uh, within the uh, NIC, then the, uh, the, the host itself is protected from, for example, denial of service attacks. Uh, the other advantage, of course, is now the CPU is freed up. It's not spending its time running all of these management processes. It's able to get on with doing the tasks that it has to do. So the concept here is to move much of the work uh, that's currently running on host processors into the intelligent, into the smart NIC, um, so that the uh, CPU, the CPUs in the server can get on with doing what they're supposed to do. And of course, because we have uh, specific acceleration engines within the DPU to do tasks, then of course, uh, they can do that much faster than the uh, generic CPU can do with software programming. And so in the same way that we introduced CUDA as the architecture and cool toolkit for uh, programming and uh, using the accelerated uh, computing engine, the GPU. We now introduce Doka uh, as the toolkit and uh, SDK and platform for programming the, the, the DPU um, to do these various sorts of tasks that we want to be able to do on the DPU. And this next slide shows a number of the things that we would like to be able to do on the DPU. Um, so defining the networking in software, defining the storage in software, so it can, we can uh, make the, D, the DPU appear like a storage device, and so the host system uh, reads and sends uh, commands to and from the, uh, the DPU uh, when it's appearing like a storage device, and then the DPU takes over the task of taking those commands and actually moving, physically moving the data across to the uh, physical storage itself. And also then there's the aspects of security uh, in which we, um, all of the security of the node is handled on the DPU, uh, meaning that uh, the CPUs the, and GPUs, the compute engines within the node are very well protected uh, and are not, not going to be interfered with by any sort of attack from outside. So the, the model of security within the data center is now changing. Um, in the past, it might have been at the periphery of the data center where you had con network connections to the outside world that all of the uh, security was handled. We can now distribute the security infrastructure across the whole data center so that each node has its own uh, method of being kept secure. Perhaps less uh, important for the uh, supercomputing center like KAUST um, or your core labs, at Ka your, your supercomputing lab at KAUST, 
but perhaps a very much more interest to the general IT infrastructure within the campus, as of course that um, VMware is the is a very uh, common uh, platform for managing uh, IT infrastructure, and we. Um, particularly within the enterprise, VMware is the standard environment in which uh, enterprise uh, hardware is managed. And again, we have a similar sort of issue here, as I spoke of in, pre in the previous slides, that the uh, VMware software is running on the uh, host CPU, taking a significant amount of time out of that uh, processing capacity on the node itself. Since we have processors within the DPU, so the DPU has a fully fled, a full ARM processor within it, why not take that uh, uh, virtualization and management and hypervisor infrastructure out of the server itself and move that onto the DPU? And so we have uh, initiated with uh, VMware a project that we call Project Monterey, whose goal is to move the uh, hypervisor software from VMware onto the ARM processor to relieve the uh, ARM processor of the, um, of the effort required of the, you know, the cost of, uh, to remove the cost of running that, that infrastructure from the, CPU, from the pro CPU processors onto the DPU itself. So I at, uh, in the title here to talk about the universality of uh, the GPU and where it can be used. Um, and there are going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to go run through a number of uh, application areas for the GPU. Um, so first of all, we have artificial intelligence. Uh, of course, I'm very pleased to hear that this year, uh, KAUST is setting up its first AI hackathon. Uh, and we have um, a couple of examples here, uh, both from the training aspects and from the inference aspects of where the GPU is able to provide acceleration. Uh, we have a new floating point number format within the uh, most recent generation of NVIDIA GPUs that we call TF32. Um, so the thing about TF32 is that it has the resolution of uh, FP32, um, sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. It has the dynamic range of uh, FP32, so the same number of bits are uh, allocated to the exponent in TF32 as in FP32, but the resolution is reduced, so fewer bits are allocated to the mantissa. So the uh, resolution of the, uh, of the number format is similar to uh, FP16. Um, so as a consequence, we have a shorter word length, which means that we can move data around, around the processor more quickly, we can calculate more quickly with it, and we can get uh, acceleration simply because we have shorter word lengths, less data to move around, and can process it more quickly. Uh, but also, it's, uh, there is very little risk of your application not working. Uh, in the sense that an overflow and underflow cannot occur because we have the same dynamic range as FP32. But there is a reduction, of course, in resolution, so it can't be, um, you have to check that your application really is working well. But what we have, we have so far found no case, at least within AI, in which uh, TF32 resolution uh, provide, delivers, um, gives, gives any issues. And this uh, acceleration using TF32 is transparent to the user. Uh, he doesn't have to do anything other than enable TF32 within his application. And so with, a, you know, with a, just a few moments of work, he is able to get, um, up here we show a 6x uh, improvement in performance. But of course, this is uh, just the first step. This is just, an, the, our goal here is to demonstrate to users that, uh, <clears throat> Um, reduced precision arithmetic is valuable in the field of artificial intelligence. And that's just the first step. If you want to go further of using full FP16, then uh, you can indeed, and you, that does require some effort on the application developer's part to implement FP16. Uh, but what, having seen the value of starting to reduce precision 
uh, please continue down the path of using the of exploring the the value of FP16 for your application. Similarly, we've got uh, on the right hand side here an illustration of the value of that uh, multi instance GPU app uh, that we saw before, in which we are simply increasing the throughput of our inference engine by using uh, multiple uh, instances, multiple NIC instances. We also work in the area of data analytics. So uh, TPCXBB is a data analytics standard data analytics benchmark. Uh, and NVIDIA submitted results to that, uh, that benchmark. And what you could see here is that uh, with uh, using GPUs, uh, the equivalent performance is available at one seventh of the cost and one third of the power compared with an equivalent performance uh, CPU application. Another area in which we're working on is with Apache Spark. So we started um, a couple of years ago uh, making some implementations of uh, some improvements to Spark 2, uh, in which uh, some plugins such as XGBoost uh, were accelerated using GPUs. We've greatly, in Spark 3, we've greatly uh, expanded the GPU acceleration areas of application uh, so that now large parts of the uh, Spark 3 are accelerated with GPUs. Now, I know we appreciate that this is a, a new, um, Spark 3 is a new release of Spark, so not many customers are using it yet, but when they move from Spark 2 to Spark 3, uh, they immediately have the capability of accelerating their work using GPUs. Um, to turn to something that is uh, more familiar to the uh, to the um, KAUST uh, supercomputing lab, uh, here we see the improvements in HPC performance of a basket of applications as we move from the uh, previous generation of V100, which is uh, shown as the unit reference uh, performance here, to the current generation, the most recently released generation of GPU, the A100. And once again, uh, you know, out of the box performance between one and a half and two times performance uh, increase, simply by going from one generation of GPU to the next. We have been very active in the uh, field of MLPerf, which is the standardized um, set of benchmarks for uh, machine, for, sorry, for AI uh, work. Um, and you see on this chart here, the various comparisons between uh, NVIDIA submissions, uh, A100 and V100, and some of our competitors, such as the Google TPU, and the Huawei uh, spe specialized AI chip. Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention the fact that NVIDIA has uh, won the majority of these um, submissions. And also we made submissions across the board to all of the branches of the benchmark, uh, unlike many of our competitors who perhaps just submitted a few where they thought they were going to do well. Um, and so the first one was, this is the uh, at scale, simply if you throw as much hardware as you possibly can at the, uh, at the problems, how fast can you go in total? Um, similarly, this is uh, for the single processor performance. And again, you see that uh, NVIDIA is doing uh, across the board, leading the way for, uh, for these uh, various things. Uh, and similarly, this is the, the uh, inference benchmark. So the first two were training benchmarks. Here is the inference performance of the uh, of the GPU. So again, uh, very good scores from NVIDIA for all of these benchmarks. If you want to start using these tools, then we provide a. Uh, a Container repository in which the tools that we uh, use for generating for for running codes. So you have uh, containers with the applications. You have containers with models, Helm charts for deploying these models, 
uh, various SDKs, toolkits, and applications, all available within container within uh, containers, so that you can easily move those uh, containers between the various hardware platforms that you might be using, your uh, internal uh, systems, uh, your cloud support, your hybrid cloud, and in, in even your edge computing systems. Whatever architecture those systems might be built on, whether it's x86 or ARM or power processors. So since I work for the um, sales part of NVIDIA, uh, I should said, tell you a little bit about our products as well as the tech technology directions that we're going in, because this is not intended to be a, a hard sell to, to you for NVIDIA products. We have plenty of other meetings uh, where we do that. But just to show you where, we're, where we are with our, with our products today, um, the latest generation of GPU is called the A100. And we deliver the A100 in various form factors. So on the left-hand side, a single uh, PCI board that can go into uh, mainstream servers. And you have um, some NVLink capability for connecting pairs of GPUs together uh, within a server to uh, maximize the performance of moving data from one GPU to another. For the high-end uh, specialized servers, specialized accelerated computing servers, we have these um, four GPU and eight GPU base ports, and uh, NVIDIA sells this, this as a complete unit. We don't sell the individual GPU in this form factor. We sell the complete four or eight GPU uh, base port, with those GPUs being interconnected by NVLink or NVSwitch in the eight GPU uh, model. And the goal here, uh, the target audience for these is um, for the four GPU system, the target audience is the more general, pro general purpose scientific computing HPC system. And the eight GPU system is firmly targeting the uh, AI community. Here are um, key features of the A100 GPU. Uh, it's a seven nanometer uh, manufacturing technology chip. Uh, it's the got 54 billion transistors in it. So one of the largest um, pieces of silicon that's being manufactured. The tensor core architecture is a core part of the uh, GPU itself now. And generation over generation, we are increasing the flexibility and capabilities of the tensor cores. And the uh, big change uh, with this generation of uh, tensor core is to add the ability to work well, sort of two changes. One is the um, FP64 tensor cores have been added to the architecture. And the second is to add the TF32 uh, uh, tensor core, enabling this transparent acceleration of applications that can make use of TF32. We have uh, NVLink and NVSwitch that enable us to interconnect GPUs and move data more quickly from one GPU to another. Multi-instance GPU is this technology I talk about, talk, spoke about at quite some length earlier on about how we can partition the GPU into smaller elements, uh, either to run smaller problems or to increase the uh, throughput of the uh, system as a whole. And then um, the sorts of uh, matrices that you get in AI can be uh, tailored uh, during the training process to be sparse so that uh, uh, half two elements out of four may be zero and if that if you can get into that situation where some of the elements within the matrix are uh, are zeroed then you can uh, accelerate the processing of that matrix using sparse matrix manipulation hardware within the GPU. Uh, the most recent, um, uh, the most recent version of the A100 was released was announced at Supercomputing. Uh, we now have 80 gigabytes of memory on the GPU. Uh, this compares with the four gigabytes of memory we had on the GPU when I started at Nvidia uh, 12 years ago. So 80 gigabytes of memory uh, and more than two terabytes per second of peak memory bandwidth. Um, 
So this, uh, apart from that, everything else is the same as in the previous A100 model. Uh, or the change has been to move from HBM2 to HBM2E memory that allows us to increase both the capacity and the uh, bandwidth of the memory system. And then we take that uh, 80 gigabyte base board and create um, a 640 gigabyte uh, GPU memory system, eight GPU memory system. Uh, shown here, which is the uh, NVIDIA DGX uh, A100. If you can't quite afford such a large uh, system, um, then we also have now a, uh, a workstation form factor in which uh, the um, four GPUs are mounted uh, inside a workstation form factor. It's liquid cooled. Uh, you can run this in an office environment. It just plugs into the wall. So a very good system for researchers or for small uh, work groups uh, wanting a full specification uh, for GPU uh, accelerated uh, workstation. Perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, just to show you some of the things that NVIDIA does uh, internally, um, this is, uh, we have now, um, our own, we operate our own data centers um, internally for our own use. So we have uh, lots of scientists and engineers in NVIDIA who are making use of uh, GPUs in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so we've, <coughs> we have set up a standard uh, blueprint, a, a reference architecture for uh, bringing together, um, I think, yes, 20 DGX A100s plus all of the networking and storage that you would need to make a, 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 the highest performance uh, AI training system. Um, it's not our intention to get into the business of uh, selling uh, servers and systems, but we do now have a standard design that we could in principle um, sell through one of our, sell through our partners to a customer who would simply wanted to buy an off the shelf um, superpod for uh, fully optimized to the maximum for AI training. And indeed, uh, <clears throat> we do have uh, one, uh, a large uh, AI training system within NVIDIA. So the name of the cluster is um, Selene. Uh, it's not mentioned specifically here on the slide because it was done uh, just before the top 500 list was announced. But this is, I think, now number five on the top 500 list uh, from the um, supercomputing conference um, a couple of weeks ago. And so <clears throat> that's sort of been a tour of the directions that NVIDIA is going for in its technology plans, uh, how we see the um, how we see the scope of GPUs uh, moving from uh, where they started as graphics processors and maybe very specialized processors for doing scientific simulation. They've now expanded into the world of uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics. And what we are seeing now is that uh, the, the HPC world is now being driven by the requirements of, the, of artificial intelligence. So the gray line here shows the evolution of the, let's say the traditional performance measure, the top 500 list HPL performance measure. Um, this is where, how it has evolved over the last few years. But if you look at the way that the AI performance of these systems has evolved, the slope you can see is much higher. Uh, and this higher slope is enabled because we are at, because, um, not just NVIDIA, but all, or probably all um, silicon vendors are thinking about how can they add special purpose functional units into their processes that are tailored towards the specific tasks that the algorithms are going to require. And so when you are tailoring uh, your um, applications, tailoring your um, silicon design to AI, then you get this, uh, this higher slope uh, and increase in performance. Leonardo is a system that's not yet uh, deployed, uh, but has been purchased under the 
uh, procured under the Euro, Euro HPC program and will be installed uh, in Chinaka. So just to show you a few of the uh, different applications, just to show that these you know, the GPUs are used in across the board in these various application areas. Um, here are some of the ways in which NVIDIA has been used uh, in the recent uh, COVID uh, crisis. Uh, we have um, analytics, data analytics um, as, uh, for tracking the, uh, for understanding the, the genome, for tracking the, the, the scope of the, the, the of the infections, um, working on um, how can we uh, search for new drugs to, uh, to, to, to combat this disease. Um, the first uh, real 3D, 3D structural model of the protein itself. Um, AI classification uh, in the hospitals, uh, robots in the hospitals, and lots of edge applications in which we are uh, monitoring the health of people perhaps as they pass through airports and shopping centers and other large crowds. The, the most recent uh, Gordon Bell Prize uh, was uh, uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago uh, and several, seven out of ten of those finalists were using the NVIDIA platform. I've just pulled up uh, four of them here. Um, the one on the right hand side is a particular interest of mine. I, I am actively working on the square kilometer array project um, and this was a very large data analytics uh, application that was done uh, using the uh, DOE uh, supercomputers. But the, um, the largest, the winner of the prize turned out to be the one on the left hand side here, if I've got it right, um, that did this uh, extremely large uh, molecular dynamic simulation of the COVID virus that turned out to be the largest um, molecular dynamic simulation that's ever been done. But furthermore, uh, was the, the route to do performing this extremely large uh, analysis was uh, using AI as a component of the, uh, of the simulation. Um, so let me just finish with a quote that came from a recent article, a recent analyst who was looking at why NVIDIA has been so successful in the world of accelerated computing and comparing NVIDIA with some of our uh, purported competitors in this world. And what he, th what he realized was, and uh, this is really true, is that the reason that NVIDIA is successful is because of our focus on the end user of our of our of our of our platform. It's not just about providing uh, a piece of hardware and throwing it over to you, but we have to work and engage with our uh, community, uh, make sure that they can take full advantage of accelerated computing, listen to what they say, uh, and. Uh, look at new places in which accelerated computing can be used uh, and as a consequence we now have um, GPUs deployed uh, at, on, at a scale that you won't be seeing with CPUs. So uh, I recommend you take a look at this article, uh, it's I think from my perspective anyway it's an extremely good analysis of NVIDIA's, um, uh, NVIDIA's strategy. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know how we're going to run questions, whether it's going to be chat or whether we're going to allow people to talk, but uh, whatever, whatever approaches we will take, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy. Um, I assume there is a virtual applause now happening <laughs> to your uh, very nice talk. Um, so we got four questions so far uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, so I will Read them for you, and uh, you, you, we take them one by one. So I will I will start from bottom up. Uh, so the first question: We cannot afford to buy many A100s, uh, but we might get some RTX 3090. Uh, is it possible to envy link them for AI workloads? Uh, so 3090 is the consumer product, right? Correct. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you may think I know everything about every NVIDIA product, but I don't know so much about the consumer products. Um, so, N so NVLink is a is a an enterprise uh, focused um, tool. 
so so no there is no nv link capability within the uh the consumer products um we do have uh um is that there may be some works some enterprise workstation products uh that have nv link capability but even there i'm not quite not don't think there is so much um but it's really it's an enterprise solution so the the option i'd recommend here on a limited budget would be that uh, workstation where you have all the features within the workstation okay fantastic uh, next question uh is about make the multi-instant gpu uh, first question, is it supported only on A100? Yes. Uh, okay, so that's an answer. And then the question goes on about, is it possible to use the latest NVIDIA software divine system for the V100 partitioning? I believe the answer is no. Um, oh, th this, this is a good one. Is it possible to partition the memory in the cache with make N equally. So I know we have seven instances, but can we have like one half for one job and yeah. Job? Yes. So there are yes, so there are seven elements within the within the the GPU, but they you don't have to divide it into seven pieces. You can, for example, divide it up as two plus two plus one or four plus two plus one or four, and I think three I'm not sure if three is possible, but there are many ways there are several ways of grouping those um, grouping those elements within the GPU to make slightly larger GPUs that are twice or four times the basic unit size. Thank you. Um, next question from Bilal is, uh, how can the developer take advantage of the tensor code for their in-house written code? <laughs> Uh, so one of the libraries that we have, uh, perhaps I should have spent a little more time on it, is, I forgot its name, uh, Cutlass. Cutlass is the name of the library. Uh, so let me find the slide quickly. Going back along, there it is. So Cutlass. Um, so on the bottom right hand side of this picture uh, is a uh, a, live, a, a tool that allows you to create your own linear algebra uh, solvers uh, at a low level, calling the uh, calling the tensor course. Uh, and if you, the, the performance of Cutlass is actually really quite close to the Kublas and Kutensor implementations done by Nvidia. All right. Thank you very much. Um, question from Mohsen, uh, and that's a very interesting one. It's more than to system design. Uh, so given the memory capacity of A100 version 2 lately announced, it will be increased to 80 gigabytes with a bandwidth up to 2 terabytes per second. It is now more important to keep up from the I.O. sides to keep GPU well fed with data, right? So he's talking about I.O. now, how to keep that GPU fed. So in multi-user environment, so like Kaust in our cluster, with GPU direct storage, what kind of storage backend is recommended by NVIDIA? Option one, is it a shared parallel file system with fast SSDs or local storage consisting of SSDs on NVMEs within the server? Uh, I'm not going to give a clear answer to that one. Um, firstly, because uh, you'd be better off getting a real expert to talk to you about this topic, not me. Um, our strategy here is to uh, work, so we work with the big names in storage uh, devices, you know, NetApp, DDN, um, and so on, you know, Weka, IO, all these people are NVIDIA partners, and we, we work with them to create uh, reference architectures for storage infrastructure uh, connected to GPUs. Um, I don't want to say one is better than the other because if I mention one name, the other one is going to get annoyed with me. Uh, but uh, these are all good. We, we, we work with all of our storage vendors, storage partners to make good solutions. Uh, as for the detailed um, architecture, uh, the only thing I'm going to talk about is the DGX, which is, of course, NVIDIA's own architecture. And we do have um, several terabytes of NVMe storage within the node itself. 
Uh, but for sure, if this becomes a real question, then we can get uh, the right experts. Uh, you know, real, a real question in terms of building an actual system, then certainly we'll get the right experts to talk to, to Karst about this. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is my own question. So, um, what are your comments about customized solution for AI like Cerebras? Is NVIDIA going to continue the same gradual improvement direction? Or uh, is NVIDIA planning at the same time uh, some similar revolutionary technology out of the box? Uh, <coughs> So we don't have anything hidden in our pockets uh, that we, uh, unless it's so hidden, I don't know about it. <laughs> you never know. But uh, I'm assuming that our strategy is to continue in the direction that we are going. Uh, what I would like to point out compared with all of these um, other, there are two things I'd like to point out. So first of all is the universal GPU strategy that NVIDIA is following of the universal accelerator strategy. So GPUs are valuable not only for AI, but also scientific computing and data analytics and artificial intelligence and visualization and all the, you know, all the things that I've mentioned today. So a GPU is a, a broad platform that has, a, uh, a, has many, um, ex, many applications uh, rather, and you just need to, you need to learn it once. Uh, you don't need to learn a new um, system every time you want to move to a different uh, domain of application of accelerated computing. Uh, and the second thing I'd like to point out is that uh, in the MLPerf benchmarks, uh, NVIDIA, this, and of course, first of all, MLPerf is not NVIDIA's benchmark, it's a community uh, accepted benchmark. Uh, but NVIDIA was the company that submitted results across the board to every category of ML, uh, ML training and ML inference. Uh, if these uh, competing systems are so good, uh, let's see the benchmarks. Fantastic. Uh, one more question coming here. Um, how does ARM fit the NVIDIA ecosystem in the future? Oh, okay. Whatever you can say on the public. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I only had an hour, so I didn't have, uh, the, there's always some topics I don't cover, so we can talk briefly about the ARM ecosystem. Uh, first of all, uh, NVIDIA is an ARM licensee and has been for many years, and you see already ARM processors in NVIDIA's embedded products, and you see ARM processors in uh, the Mellanox products. So NVIDIA is a user of ARM already. Uh, <clears throat> we are now supporting, as an equal citizen within the CUDA platform, the ARM processor as a, as a host system. Um, so our software platform uh, is available on ARM processors. Uh, it may take a little while to get everything working, but that's the strategic goal is to have full support for the ARM as a host processor equal to the x86 processor. Uh, and the third thing you're probably wanting me to talk about uh, is the ARM acquisition. Uh, and I'm not going to do that because it's such a sensitive matter for the uh, regulatory um, decisions about uh, acquiring ARM, uh, but suffice it to say, we believe you know, this. We believe this is the right thing to do. We believe there is enormous um, synergy between uh, the two companies, and that together we will have a you know a very good business model. Fantastic, thank you. And one last question. <laughs> um, uh, how do you see the upcoming uh, new GPUs from AMD and Intel? Uh, do you consider them as competitor for which segments or only the CPU uh, or, or, or only on the CPU with your ARM processor? Let us first of all acknowledge that uh, our competitors make very good hardware. They have smart engineers. Um, we have this access to the same technology um, so they can make uh, processors 
that have that whose spec sheet uh, is com definitely competitive with Nvidia. Uh, what in but let me again turn back to the whole message of this presentation, which is that Nvidia has spent fifteen years building an ecosystem. So think about the fact that Nvidia has thousands of engineers working on accelerated computing software. Uh, and they've been working for 10 years. You just look at the, just paying their salaries is already billions of dollars of investment. And that is the, uh, what the competitors have to catch up with is this multi-billion dollar investment in the ecosystem. And I remind you, of course, that NVIDIA is not going to uh, sit still and let them catch up. Uh, even if they do invest a lot of money, we are continuing to invest and we will keep moving forward. So they've always, they have a lot, they will have to invest at twice that rate to be able to catch up within 10 years. Very good answer. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that's a good closing, I think, for, the, for our session. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for all the outstanding questions. And thanks a lot, Timothy, for the great presentation. Uh, we look forward to see you on the 8th edition with uh, another <laughs> yet more exciting keynote hopefully face to face <laughs> yes. um, obviously we would love to see you even before hopefully uh, if, if if things uh, gets better uh, with everyone uh, so with that thank you all very much and uh, we'll follow up with you on the next talk at 2 p.m thank you have a good one thank you bye bye thank you Dean.